Welcome back, and welcome to the closing part of our event. Well, but I have to be uh, specific, because we normally, when we, were, we use the word closing, we feel that we are very close to the end. Not yet, dear friends. We, still, we will still spend the next two hours together, and we still have one more session, the closing, but plenary session in front of us. And that will not be like a soft walk. That will be actually quite intense, uh, quite interesting, and quite informationful. So in the next and in the closing plenary, uh, we will be looking for answers to the question, what are the challenges in implementation of maritime spatial plans? And uh, addressing the challenges in implementation of MSP across all levels. So for the next uh, session, again, I will welcome back my wonderful stage partner, not in crime, but definitely in uh, maritime spatial plans. So, my wonderful stage partner from the Scottish Highlands will take over this um, closing session. But Rona, I think I was right when I said that, that people should still brace themselves for another quite intense round of communication, right? I think so. We have five wonderful speakers representing four terrific countries around the Baltic Sea for this last session. We'll be able to draw on direct experiences as part and parcel of their presentations or, or their, uh, their conversations. This is a, a plenary session. We don't have slides, but we will be speaking and engaging in conversation with the, the following people. So I'm really looking forward to finding out what they all have to say. So we have our speakers as, this, as part of this process. Uh, Donata, oh my goodness, Donata, I'm, I'm so sorry about pronouncing your second name, Paulauskaita, I hope. Oh, anyway, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyway, Chief Specialist from the Lithuanian Ministry of the Environment. Um, and you'll be obviously talking about what's happening within the Lithuanian sphere of influence. Natalia Zaszak, uh, Head of the Integrated Development and MSP Unit in the Polish Ministry of Infrastructure. Tina Tielman, the Ministerial Advisor from the Finnish Ministry of the Environment. Karina Rautio uh, from Helsinki Usima, is that right? Regional Council and Planning Manager, uh, Karl and Karl Dahlberg from the Liskil Municipality in Sweden. Um, excellent. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to ask you as in this first part of this session to briefly outline what's been happening in relation to maritime spatial planning in each of your own countries um, and where you are with the implementation of the maritime spatial plans that you have at the moment or their development. So Don, Donata, Donata, Don, tell us about Poland first of all please. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry to, uh, ladies, sorry to quickly interrupt you but um, and thank you for introducing your great selection of panelists for this closing round. But again, I want to still introduce my part of the team, which is the viewers, the online participants. And you know how much I love them and care for them. So I want to get them more involved in this panel discussion as well, in this plenary discussion. And that's why we will add another word cloud. Is that fine for you, Rona? Uh, yes, of course, absolutely. Sorry, well, apologies. Let's do that. And would you agree with me that we... We are quite interested in checking if the opinion of our visitors and, and viewers and participants has changed in the course of these two days spent together. So um, we were thinking about adding actually the same word cloud that uh, you all saw yesterday when we started this event. Actually, the one that kind of, in a way, launched it. Because Rona mentioned that it's quite sunny in Edinburgh. It is very sunny in Riga, so let's add a cloud to this day. Probably the last one we will have in, uh, in the course of this event. So we will add a word cloud with the same question you were asked yesterday. And what we're going to do at the end of this uh, closing plenary session is we're going to compare them and see how did or uh, didn't your opinions change and your viewpoints change in the course of these two days. So the word cloud is already there. I see it in the platform. You are free to fill your opinions and your uh, words in it. But now again, back uh, Rona to you and your amazing panelists. 
Thank you. Just on that point about the word cloud, um, can the technical team make sure that the link to it is in the chat pane? Because I've had problems earlier in the process trying to link on to the word clouds and I've got at them through the links that have been in the chat pane rather than from the, the little boxes. So if you could make it live in the chat pane, then people such as me can link into it and add our, our words. Would that be okay? Thank you. Right, Donata. Back to you. So tell us where we are in Poland in relation to maritime spatial planning, please. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so good afternoon, Rona. Hello, everyone from San Diego Linus. And uh, well, currently in Lithuania, uh, we're dealing, with, at least in my uh, pool of works, uh, we're dealing with this new comprehensive plan of Republic of Lithuania, uh, which uh, should be approved by the government in the coming months. We, uh, we're planning to uh, finish this approval several months ago, but because of pandemic, because of uh, change of government, uh, we had a delay, but still um, moving on, and it's... Uh, a headache and a joy, but we want to finish this uh, stage and go on. So this would be a short um, information from my, my side. And my apologies for getting your country totally wrong. I, I'm so sorry. Yep. Um, but uh, wonderful. So when do you think you've, you've mentioned the delays that have been caused by a change of government and also the, the COVID situation, which will, I imagine, have a knock on impact on your final consultation and stakeholder engagement? Do you have an idea of time about when it might be completed? I think in coming months until autumn, it, uh, it's our plan until autumn to finish it. Great. OK. And I do like your description of it being both a headache and a joy. That certainly is, is a familiar concept <laughs> when it comes to marine planning in lots of different places, I'm sure. Wonderful. Right. Natalia, I will get your country right. You are representing Poland. Would you like to, to fill us in on where you are with the MSP and the introduction to it then, please? Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I need to say that I'm so glad to hear that Poland appears here in so many contexts uh, during this forum. <laughs> so it's it's really nice. Um, we actually adopted our MSP, MSP just recently. So we are very happy about it. Uh, Council of Ministers adopted the plan on 14th April. And we were waiting for publishing it uh, for a month, and uh, it came into force on 22nd May. So I think it's, it can be an official day of uh, MSB holiday in Poland. Yes, uh, and now we starting that phase of implementation. Thank you. That's terrific. We'll, we will come back to the challenges of development and implementation later in this session. But now we have a joint contribution from Finland. Um, so Karina Rautio, you'll go first and then Tina will pick up on some of the points that you make. So ladies, over to you. Thank you, Rona. And um, hello to everybody. My name is Karina Rautio and I work for Helsinki Uusimaa Regional Council as a planning manager. I'm a team leader in environmental and GIS issues. I've been preparing regional plans since more than 20 years. I would like to point out that in Finland, regional councils are responsible for both regional plans, regional programs, and now uh, maritime spatial planning. And uh, I'm a member of Finnish Maritime Spatial Coordinating Group and I have been prepared MSP for the Gulf of Finland together with my colleagues in regional councils and Ministry of Environment, that means Tina. <laughs> and we have been eight regional councils. And it was in the end of uh, last year, um, all the regional councils have uh, ratified the plan. So it's now in Brussels. <laughs> Uh, regional plans 
uh, which are legally binding, cover both land and marine areas. So this means that this is a, not not a totally new thing uh, to, to pay, take care of the <laughs> seaside for regional councils. Uh, that means that regional councils have the mandate to play uh, uh, plan their territorial waters with regional plans. And so at, at the moment, uh, the MSP is in the implementation phase in Finland. Excellent. So you'll be able to talk to us again about the difference between the development and the implementation phases as they start. But Tina, from on behalf of the Ministry of Environment, would you like to, to comment on your experience of, of uh, where things are at the moment? Yes, thank you. Yes, um, as Karina said, we our, our MSP was five MSP. Now it's a uh, one one plan made in three pieces. So it was finalized in December 2020, and now it's in Brussels, as Karina said. And now we are preparing to monitor and evaluate uh, it and uh, the process and. Um, so we are preparing monitoring and evaluation program, and we are also looking for financing for it, <laughs> which will, which seems to be quite hard at the moment. But uh, what happens now is that uh, our our MSP for, uh, is uh, only in digital form, and now uh, all uh, built environment um, plans and and uh, information about building permits and so on. They will be only in digital in, in, in the coming years. And we are, uh, we are preparing that in Finland, in the ministry. And now our MSP will be part of that. So that, that's what's happening right now. And uh, um, yes, and our... <laughs> coordinator who has uh, who has uh, been responsible for all cooperation in, in maritime spatial planning Mari Pohjanmykrä she's very busy still she she's been <laughs> invited to speak about our plan uh, several occasions and she's preparing information materials and she's uh, very much communicating now with all uh, um, information people in all regional councils and also in the ministry so we are spreading information and and preparing to implement the plan and monitoring and evaluation program and digital Wonderful. information and yeah. <laughs> thanks I, i'll come back to this point about digital uh, information later on. I think that's something that, that we'll need to pick up on. But it's great to know that your planner is in such grand demand, such great demand uh, for spreading the word and disseminating the information about what you're doing. That's terrific. And last, but by no means least, uh, this part, Carl Dahlberg. Tell us about the Swedish example, please. So very nice to be invited to take part. My name is Carl Dahlberg and I work on the west coast of Sweden. And um, what we do what I've been doing is working on the uh, municipal level with four municipalities in a sort of sub-regional uh, perspective, you could say, and uh, planning our municipal uh, plans. And uh, as this plan is, is nested with the national plan, uh, which has taken, uh, been taken forward in Sweden, uh, these two plans sort of play a, a lot of this interaction in between the different levels that we discussed during the days here. Uh, but the, the stage right now for the uh, MSP on the national level is that it's been uh, put forward by SWAM, the agency in charge, uh, put forward to the government, and it's on the government's table to decide at the at present. And it's been there for, uh, I'd say, a year and a half almost. Um, oh, are you able to comment about why it's is it taking a while because it's so interesting and it's so full of information that the government are working their way through it or do they I'm have other priorities sorry, I, I, i'm terribly sorry there but i'm the wrong person to ask that question and there there are others in the in the audience that, that could answer that question but i'm That's pretty sure that it will it will uh, it will get there eventually uh, 
Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, the pressure, I guess, from the EU level is on, as, as a lot of these other countries already have their plans in state. I think it's more a practical issue. It is always a case of practical issues. Yes, there's there's never enough time to consider everything that needs to be done. But great, that's fine. Thank you very much for that whistle stop, quick whirlwind tour. We'll come back to the to some of the points that you've you've picked up on the the digital element in particular. That that could be something that we address in the first of these next questions because I'm going to ask you now about which aspect of the MSP process do you see adding the most value to implementing what has been developed in your, your country so far? So we can talk about the value of, of data gathering and, and when enough data you think or when more data is, is required, when it could be enough, greater awareness of how different activities interact with each other, um, pilot projects, testing possibilities for co-location of activities in different areas. But just to pick up on the digital thing, Tina and, and Karina, um, how, I know that the Finnish population is very digitally aware. Um, anybody who had a Nokia telephone cannot fail to, to understand why. And I put my hand up to that as well. But how do you overcome um, any problems or challenges with people who are not completely tied into a digital approach? Do you still make allowances for stakeholders who perhaps might prefer a slightly more analog approach to participation? Ladies, are you, you able to offer some thoughts? Okay, maybe I, I start. We actually didn't have so much um, difficulties with that because um, in MSP, I feel that the most uh, most of the stakeholders, they are associations, uh, authorities, uh, institutions, and they, they all can handle information in digital form. There were some... some um, individual uh, persons uh, who who would have liked to have some materials on paper but I know I know one <laughs> so I don't know if uh, if the if others uh, uh, know more but um, uh, uh, this is this is also new in in Finland so we are forerunners in in drafting a plan only in digital form. And um, Karina can maybe add something because um, because um, regional councils are a statutory organization of municipalities. Uh, so it's a municipal organization and and it's a political political organization. And politicians has to may make the decision of MSP. So this was approved in all eight regional councils. <laughs> the, this is tricky. Uh, regional councils first did um, a plan together uh, and uh, and they had much uh, larger area than their own area. But then they could uh, finally approve it only from their own part. And this was a bit tricky uh, for us and we were excited that <laughs> how does this go but it went well but Karina can you add a bit about that how how you dealt with your politicians uh, uh, totally in digital form and this is um, this has been a good practice when we think that in regional plans I think we are going for the uh, same same system. Uh, nowadays, uh, after Land Use and Building Act, we have to have uh, the, the 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 real map on paper. But and we have asked why, <laughs> because uh, every uh, nearly everybody is in uh, internet and uh, our regional council works. Uh, thanks to the coronavirus now now totally <laughs> digitally so so this is the future and i think this has um, been a good experience in that way and uh, uh, that there will always be some some people um, some um, 
participants who needed to get uh, uh, just by, by, by paper something, but it, it's easy to, to get. If we, if we take a PDF copy and then send it or, or can even send it by post, if somebody needs, because there can be a few persons who, who need to get get the information that, that way, but it's a minority. I think that's a really good point to make that if you are, if you take the decision to do marine planning on a digital platform, first of all, then it sets in train the other elements that, that come along afterwards. Um, and the the way that everybody is having to work on digital platforms now as a result of the coronavirus has pushed forward, I suspect, the development of the digital platform. So we're now all going to be doing MSP via Zoom, our teams or any of these other platforms in future. So perhaps this, the unfortunate events over the last 12 or 18 months are pushing forward something that would have happened in any case. But it's very interesting to hear that you took that decision but yet there are still opportunities to uh, to work with with those who are um a little bit behind the curve on the other side of things lithuania and and sweden and, and poland are you finding the same situation that the uh, the planning processes that you're going through have um they may have there may be a slight delay in approval of plans but the process is still going on even despite the the delays that we experience with the the coronavirus process are you all still managing to get the marine planning done? Does anybody jump in? Okay, Carl? so maybe I start there with uh, Sweden. Um, so I think that uh, we um, uh, we are getting the, the planning done and, and on a sort of, while we're waiting for the, the MSP on the national level, we are still doing it uh, locally and that in our area, in our region, we have had this uh, implemented for now uh, two, two years, a little bit more, two and a half years. And uh, we're more sort of learning from what's coming out of the plan and what, what's, how it's being implemented and uh, uh, what, what considerations are taken, how are the courts looking at it, how is the mun county municipal, municipal, municipal board looking at the issues, um, how are the uh, municipalities themselves handling it in their, uh, in their work, are they uh, are they uh, looking into it? Are they using the plan? Is it is it being uh, is, is it being implemented? And and uh, how could it have been in a different way? And I think that in terms of what we learned in the last <clears throat> year, in terms of working digitally and and uh, so on, we've taken long steps forward. We were ready for it from the beginning. I work with uh, regional development issues and coastal communities and things like that, and. Uh, it's quite much easier getting people to meetings and, and getting them to join and so on. And our, our, get, our get agendas are full. Uh, I also think that this getting people to uh, take part and so on is easier now when we have these different tools. Uh, Jutta Boy was uh, showing with Ida Lindberg here in one of the meet, uh, one of the conference meeting rooms. Um, how they looked at, uh, they, they did different types of GIS services, for example. You can get, you can get uh, inquiries out to many more people. Uh, you can also, which I think is a very good and handy, handy thing to do. Um, and our social media helps uh, pinpointing specific issues and then doing an inquiry on that specific issue. And then you take another issue and do an inquiry on that issue. And in that way, you can get a wider range of, of uh, public opinion about different things. And I think that um, was a little bit underused in, in the process that we had up, up to now. I should mention maybe that we did both uh, business strategy and, uh, and uh, uh, MSP for our regional area. And these two things together uh, added the value for us. Uh, because that created the, the need for the plan and the, this combination uh, created something which was uh, politically attractive and interesting and uh, worthy. Um, and I think what Ida was showing in that uh, in that um, session there uh, yesterday uh, was uh, was pretty good. So so I think that's a, this interviewing uh, businesses and that type of thing. We need to do more of that. That's a really interesting um, aspect to pick up on. And just in relation also to the, the 
direct the dynamics with social media i suppose if you're doing an awful lot of of work that's online it's easy to flag up on linkedin or facebook or any of these other things what it is you're doing so again you're disseminating the information and making it available pretty much in real time uh, yeah on, in some on ways and, and you need one of them to push the other so to say you need yeah, it's a step process and uh, yeah excellent yeah. ah a great great example there natalia any any things like that to, to add? What's the added value that you've discovered from the process in Poland? The added value for the implementation phase uh, from the process. Uh, I th I was thinking a lot about that question, you know, because uh, it's like uh, everything was uh, important. Uh, we we gathered data. Uh, we learned a lot from each other. We, we, I think, uh, also people, everyone saw how busy our C is and how many activities we need to take into consideration and also future activities. So that knowledge, that broader knowledge is, is, is the key. But, uh, I think the greatest value actually, uh, is that a broad consultation process, uh, which, in my opinion, uh, created something like emotional attachment to the document uh, for those people who were attending uh, that consultation process. And because in implementation phase, the, the crucial thing is that we all agree that we need to follow that document, that we want to use it, we want to utilize it, we want to realize it. And we as MSP authorities, we should not make people to follow the rules. We should not punish them for not following. People should feel that this is a document which should be followed because it's good, because it's a compromise, because this is what it's good for all the interests. And even if uh, particular interests are not entirely addressed in the document, uh, people who attended consultations and discussions, they, they can think that when they read specific provision, they, they can visualize the discussion, they can visualize faces of their opponents and even if, as I said, uh, the particular interests are not addressed fully, people know that um, this is the best what they could get. And they voluntarily follow that rules, that provisions. And this wouldn't be possible at all uh, if that consultation process was not so thorough was not so long term because in Poland it has many phases. Uh, it was uh, very open. Everybody could uh, make a remark and it had three phases because we had actually uh, that adopted plan. It's the fourth version of the project. So on every stage, the participation was great, I think, uh, from my point of view. Uh, and uh, as I said, everybody could could give the remark, everybody could comment. Uh, so I think this is the most added value. Thank I you. I think that's a that's a very good point because it it relates back to ownership. And if you are encouraging people to follow the plan, um, there's a saying that it's easier to to attract. Uh, was it easier to attract flies with honey rather than vinegar? So if it's encouraging you um, to make sure that stakeholders want to participate and take part in the whole process, it's it's a an, a better way of including them. Um, can I just ask briefly uh, and across all of you and Don Donata, I'll come to you in a second. But have you, when you have been going through the development process, have you captured the comments that have come through from the stakeholder engagement and explained why suggestions have perhaps been incorporated in second or third editions or perhaps why they haven't been? Has, that, has there been that level of transparency so that stakeholders are aware their contributions have been identified and logged and may have been acted on 
or may not have been. Donna, Don, uh, Donata, can you speak to that in, on the, in terms of the Lithuanian experience? I can comment uh, shortly about uh, we have this log of uh, proposals we had. We had like uh, in the previous workshop I mentioned we had more than 2,000 written form uh, proposals which we later evaluated and uh, wrote to whom we agree and to whom uh, uh, which proposals we um, uh, put away or um, and why and it was a long process and uh, but i think this feedback is very important because you keep um, keep your stakeholders uh, informed you keep them in touch uh, with all the um, happening decisions and that's very crucial and i think um, getting back to the main question this uh, aspect of all planning that still has an echo up, up until today is this uh, open and inclusive process. So I totally agree with Natalia that, um, uh, yeah, it sure takes time and patience and uh, definitely takes a good team and leadership skills to, um, to make this process going. But uh, it's highly important and... Um, Mm, I think in the end of the day, it uh, it affects the implementation. It affects the ongoing process. What we have, uh, uh, one thing we have uh, uh, in Lithuania is that after completing this process of uh, planning, we have uh, um, a document called uh, implementation plan. And uh, uh, this plan is also approved by the government. And uh, uh, we are already preparing for this new stage. We are eager to move on and get to actual numbers and measures. And uh, I would say that uh, it's um, like a very concentrated action plan um, where all the ministries agree to concrete actions, measures, um, financial parts, uh, terms and indicators for each thematic solutions. And this is really important to have this action plan. I would agree. Uh, my, yes, I would agree with a, a well thought out action plan, particularly that covers a huge range of different governmental procedures and policy areas. So marine planning, underpins so many different areas and when you start thinking about it you realize just quite how many aspects are encompassed or are, are touched by it um so that that sounds like a, a great idea um i'm just looking back at some of the other points that are coming through um the sorry uh just we've d dealt with the digital plans. There's some chat in the the the, ch the chat pane, um, and there was a suggestion that perhaps the commission or the uh, could require maritime spatial plans to be in digital format. But it's come through to say jo Jochen saying um, the EU can't require digital plans because it's not included in the current directive. That's true. Um, but it is possible that that could be encouraged for future, I suppose, for future iterations of planning as technology itself changes. And whoever made the point about, I think it was Natalia, about stakeholders seeing um, or remembering particular discussions when they see text in an eventual document, I cannot read the MSP directive without thinking of the discussions that went on in the background before we agreed the text that ultimately materialised. So yes, your point is, is very well made on that front. Um, so therefore, we've reflected there about the importance of stakeholder engagement on many many different levels and at many different points throughout the existing development process. So how do you think the engagement um, routine, the engagement process itself is going to change and going to differ once we move into the implementation phase? Because there's clearly been a huge amount of effort uh, and time expended in the development side of things. 
but we cross over a threshold when we start putting marine plans into action. Um, is, do you have ongoing mechanisms to maintain the stakeholder engagement? We, we heard a call earlier this morning for some kind of formalised forum to make sure that regulators and other industry interests and other stakeholders continue talking to each other. Does anybody have something along those lines that they're able to share? Carl? Yeah, so I think that we have a very important uh, learning period now. I mean, we're in the beginning, we're implementing something. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are seeing now as we're using, well, this is on the regional level then, but anyway, we're seeing it implemented and there's small things happening, different types of permits. We have to learn from all that uh, process. And um, I think maybe the, the, the stakeholders or, or the, the people who have been involved with these different permits and, and actions will be more important in this process now when we're doing this sort of the second round a little bit. Uh, I'm also thinking about these sort of visionary ideas that we had from the beginning with sort of large, uh, uh, maybe uh, algal, uh, um, algal uh, aquaculture sites and, and offshore energy farms and things like that on uh, wave energy. And a lot of these um, more or less visionary ideas from the beginning have actually taken part and, and changed and become uh, more or less, you know, uh, close, close to being there. And we now heard uh, the other day at uh, one, of the, uh, one of the meetings that Frederick, that the company in, in the north of Boosland then has a 30 hectare uh, algal production um, permit. And that's like the first big permit. And we have had lots of discussions about different regulations and how regulations should be changed and how it's not connected to what the current state of technology is and so on. And and we're seeing a lot of this, all of these things are changing and we're seeing the directives are changing and we're now going from a sort of blue growth to sustainable blue development and these things. And that's, it's quite a large, uh, a large change in the wording from where we, when we started this work, say seven years ago or something like that, when it was blue growth, uh, that was the center. And, and looking at the communication that was uh, just, it was sent in a link at, at this meeting, it's just two weeks old uh, from the 17th of May. Uh, and then, then it has a totally different view of what the, um, uh, what society should do with these issues and how this development should change uh, uh, and how this should be much more environmentally coupled and so on, um, which is very interesting and definitely will make the next revisions different. And um, it was decided early on in the Swedish case that um, aquaculture would not be part of the uh, plan as there was not enough to to uh, work with on the sort of uh, the the outside uh, should you say the outer waters in terms of aquaculture. But now it's there, and now the discussions are there. And this multi-use, I must add that the multi-use session, uh, I think it was session five there with Nirvana, was a very good session with a very interesting connecting fisheries and and uh, and um, and wind energy. Algal, uh, uh, algal farms and wind energy, all these multiple uh, recent, uh, multiple uses and how the importance of, uh, of making that through policy and connecting it to make it happen. Otherwise it won't happen. I think those discussions were very good in that session. I think that's that's a really interesting point to pick up and I'll bring the rest of you in at this point as well. Um, is there anything that has emerged during the course of your discussions that perhaps hasn't been directly picked up in your current generation of marine plans, maritime spatial plans, but which will need to be reflected in a future generation? It's, it's terrible to be thinking that we need to plan ahead to the next generation of plans, even when the ink on the first generation is, is still a little bit wet. But certainly in Scotland, our experience of that wasn't so much with aquaculture, although it does reflect that as the aquaculture technology evolves, fish farms can be pushed further offshore into to deeper waters. But particularly floating wind farms is coming through within our 
um, our experience. So we've had fixed wind farms around Scotland for a long time, but now the technology again is evolving and our approach to marine planning will have to reflect where floating elements go. For Lithuania and for Poland and for Finland, are there any other sectors that have suddenly evolved and that your plans are going to have to take into account? Anybody? Yes, Natalia, go ahead. Yes, on the last stage uh, in adopting MSP, so uh, during our legislative procedure, which was relatively short, because uh, we applied uh, a special procedure which was shorter than normal, <laughs> uh, it appeared that we didn't address, according to one of our ministries, Ministry of Climate and Environment, that we didn't address properly um, the technology, um, uh, hydrogen production technologies. Uh, so uh, we need to rethink uh, the space for uh, renewable energy, uh, not uh, in a way that we should not broaden uh, those areas, but we should uh, think how to put all those activities in those areas. So uh, multi-use, <laughs> that's the case. And and uh, that's, that's technology of hydrogen production. Thank you. That's very interesting. Finland, Tina and, and Karina, are you able to, to talk about this? Or uh, Donata, Lithuania, anything coming from from those areas? Yes, if, if I start. Uh, I think the, the climate change is uh, the thing which we uh, would have liked to uh, deal more, but it was really difficult to see how to how to do it and we even had a very big project on that but uh, not so much concrete uh, it it didn't result so much in the uh, in MSP and I, I I agree we didn't have a have a, this um, green green deal paper. Uh, when we did the MSP, but on the other hand, we had a uh, marine strategy framework directive and we have tried to do our plan uh, so that it will promote achieving good state of waters. And to my mind, that is really important because um, uh, if we have a good state of waters, we can add uh, maybe food production on on uh, sea area. Now we cannot uh, appoint any aquaculture areas uh, near the coast because the uh, state of waters does not allow it. But I think we should, um, and we also tried to to find out um, how to how to. Uh, uh, how to add some uh, blue bioeconomy uh, business on on maritime area, but but there's not so much experience yet about it. So these things will be uh, in the next round, and then also um, also people's view how to use the sea. That's what we are interested in more on the next round and. Uh, my personal view also is that we will uh, cooperate even more with neighboring countries on the next round and uh, on this Baltic Sea area to make the plans more coherent with each other. Um, yes. Thanks. That's thank you for that for uh, those reflections. Karina, come on, come in. Um, what do you have to add? Yeah, yes, if, if there's anything to add, um, maybe this aquaculture, aqua, about aquaculture, it, it was a uh, um, quite difficult theme uh, in our process. And uh, we tried to find uh, possible um, sites for fish farming. It's, it's very... Uh, it's a very hard <laughs> problem in Finland because of the quality of, of water, but there's big need to find places and, and uh, 
uh, we need to get more data to tackle this problem and and besides that the land sea interaction because now it's um, it seems to be so unfair that uh, uh, fish farming um, we can't have fish farming because the agriculture nutrification uh, causes the the mm, state of the um, water quality so this this these were, were quite hard discussions during the process and and uh, for example uh, Finland's Fish Farming Association was uh, was very active in the process, and and they give good um, good information, and we have good good um, um, discussions, and we we hope that they can now live <laughs> with the solution where there there are only <laughs> few possible sites and not uh, near the coastline. But anyway, we have to continue um, this discussion, and it's one of the themes which shows uh, that we have to get more uh, data and uh, more cooperation uh, without uh, themes. So. That's that's a terrific point because you're reflecting there about the the effect that activities such as farming on land have on coastal and marine areas. So again, there's the join up between multiple different EU directives. We've mentioned the MSFD, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. This brings in the Water Framework Directive and it's the MSP Directive that's that's covering all elements and, and the interests of the MSP sector that are being affected by them. So Donata, in Lithuania, how are your coastal areas, coastal and marine areas being um, impacted by what's happening on land or are the, do you have any comments to make about the, the recent discussions there? Yeah, I can make maybe a short comment uh, regarding, uh, well, we in Lithuania have this uh, uh, land which connects uh, sea and land. We have whole territory, so we don't look at the sea separately from the land. And for us, it's a uh, integrated uh, plan it's an integrated process and what happens on the land uh, it uh, happens to the sea what happens on the sea has an impact to the land we have these connections uh, for the transport for uh, uh, natural things through uh, urban systems and uh, this is a thing that uh, uh, it's very, very important. And uh, we, uh, while preparing this plan, we understood that uh, it should be as dynamic as possible because we can face various problems and various new uh, issues uh, along uh, the implementation of the plan. So um, we have some measures, like uh, we have... Uh, plans which are state important plans which can change what we have done in this uh, national plan uh, and uh, have uh, uh, different a bit different solutions from what we um, pointed out uh, we also think that uh, this um, Mm, process of always looking back and evaluating of monitoring is very important so we really uh, invest into uh, this new systems of monitoring of this implementation plan monitoring and getting back and maybe changing things if it's needed so mm, yeah that would be my short comment Turn on my microphone. Um, yes, the, the point about implementation and monitoring to see what the effects are is likely to become extremely important, obviously, as we, we move into the implementation phase for all of them. Um, there's, a, again, a couple of comments in the, the panel here, the chat panel. Um, Andrea Morse just added, I think with these emerging issues, it's really important to keep up with, with both the sectors and the front line of research to help thinking to keep one step ahead and the monitoring process obviously feeds into that because that's the evidence base from which future decisions can be uh, developed. So um, she suggests future forums for, for maritime spatial planning at different levels 
coupled to both coastal and maritime spatial planning and bringing in the effects of what happens on land. That sounds like a, a possible approach in future, but again, it's, I suppose it, it risks um, amend or it risks developing further what we already have and uh, taking advantage of, of um, processes that we, we currently have. But my next question to move on is, with this in mind, because it, it feeds in rather nicely, who else might need to be involved if they haven't been involved in the process so far? Um, now, I'm conscious that we have a range of different foundations for the marine plans that are represented here. Some are statutory, some are non-statutory. Um, some will have requirements for particular s stakeholders, I imagine, to be directly affected different areas of government policy, different regulators or, or other statutory organisations. Um, but then you have those who don't have a statutory footing, who are not regulated by any kind of, of legislation. Um, for example, recreational users and sailors and, and so on. How how can these people be further involved? I suppose it comes back to the point that we made earlier about the, the, the evolution in the engagement um, processes. But have you targeted, are you aware of people that perhaps haven't been as directly involved in the first set of development of plans as, as they might have been? And are there specific groups that you would like to target for subsequent areas? So, Donata, you were waiting patiently uh, in that last session. I'll come to you first in this one. Okay, so, but um, I'll maybe give a general answer. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a very specific, specific question and the answer should correspond to the action you want to do. Because uh, what kind of uh, project you want to implement, what kind of uh, problem you want to solve, what kind of measure you are doing, this depends what kind of people you will uh, attract and seek for. So let's say for our implementation of this comprehensive plan, we will um, have to change several existing municipality plans. And uh, what we plan to do is to meet the representatives from the municipalities, uh, city architects of those municipalities that will be coordinating this process. And of course, specialists that will be preparing those uh, comprehensive plans in, of smaller scale. So uh, this is important for mutual understanding and results. And um, another example could be this mixed uh, level organization teams. For our implementation plan, we definitely will uh, have a discussion sessions with uh, representatives from um, ministries, social partners that uh, actually means stakeholders our specialist teams and scientists and experts that uh, will uh, have to come up to uh, this plan of measures and indexes. And uh, um, these sessions can be more sectoral or more cross-sectoral according to the question, according to, to what you need to do. And uh, at sometimes you just need to critically evaluate a situation, pick up the telephone and actively invite. What we did in this uh, MSP or comprehensive plan process planning, we tend to do it ongoing. Excellent. Anybody else who'd, who'd like to, to jump in? Any, any other missing areas or, or areas of, of stakeholders who perhaps might be more directly involved in this next session or this next area? Anyone? Karina? Well, um, I, I don't disagree what I just heard, but I'd like to emphasize that in, in my experience, the involvement of general public should be possible at all planning levels. And internet gives nowadays many opportunities for that. Um, and the involvement in general public is most important at the local level anyway, for example, municipality level. And since, since in Finland, MSP is a strategic plan, it's even more important to get associations and officials, both national, regional, 
and local to take for part. The Fisherman's Association was a good example. And um, uh, another uh, would be Finnish Wind, fin, Wind Power Association. And we, we can't um, deal with, with every inhabitant, so, so it's good to have these, these associations. Uh, maybe we haven't found them all yet. But, but you are, just because you haven't found them doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, and you're still going to be able to perhaps encourage people to come on board. As more people find out about marine planning, it's a snowball effect, isn't it? More and more people will want to, we hope, will want to be involved in the process and will want to contribute to the, the onward evolution it's not revolution, it's evolution of the, the whole process. Natalia or Carl, any other comments? Carl, you switched your, your microphone off. Would you like to contribute? I think Tina is waving there, but I, I can go oh, after her. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Tina. <laughs> on you go. You're not on my screen, so I can't see you just at the moment. That's okay. fine. Let me move that. Okay, go. Okay, thank you, Carl and Rona. Yes, I, I agree with Karina that um, we, we must involve local people more. And we have good facilities for that. And but uh, I would not like to. Well, uh, in this round, everybody could take part. All interested um, individuals, uh, anyone. We had a network cooperation network, and there are over 400 participants, which is a lot in Finland. And they were all invited to all workshops. So we didn't select any 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 stakeholders, but finally we negotiated after uh, after we had made uh, our, our visions and well, first scenarios about the future of the sea, which we did with stakeholders and then, then targets, uh, how we want to proceed. And then we negotiated with those sectors, how, how they, what kind of, uh, what are the needs actually and um, yes, if I go a little bit backward to the planning process it, it was a cooperative process from the very beginning from, with stakeholders so we planned the process first with them and how the plan would look like and then we made scenarios how they see the future of the sea and finally they did the first drafts of the plan in these workshops so they, they were really engaged. And um, we treated all equally. <laughs> all opinions were as uh, valuable uh, as the others. And, and um, finally, there was a public hearing, which uh, was more, um, which was also stated in the law. And all the opinions, they were collected and then answered in, in the internet and explained what was taken into account and what not. So I, um, I can't name any, <laughs> any, any stakeholders who would uh, need to uh, part uh, participate more properly. But I can I can name uh, when Eurona named it that recreational uh, users they were a problem for us because all statistics are national or or something else or or tourist organizations are more promoting tourism not not developing it um, in a way what we would uh, uh, they don't have the data we would need <laughs> so this this is one really tricky. Thing it's really important on the coast, but we don't have coastal data of recreational use and tourism. Is, is it just to Carl? I'll come to you in a second. Is that an opportunity then that perhaps that sector could be more directly involved? We had the same problem in Scotland about a decade ago. We identified that we didn't have good, in fact, we didn't have any really data on. Um, recreational activities around our coastline, but we knew enough to know that they were a very important economic sector. Mm -hmm. So we went to our um, the Royal Yachting Association, the, the membership organisation, and explained to them where the gaps in our data 
were um, and could they help us fill them and they did but it's it's a so it's an opportunity it's identifying a gap and oppor- identifying the opportunities to fulfill it and to fill it in Carl come back to me what were you going yeah, to say please? okay so uh, in terms of the national MSP process uh, I was quite happy about that I think it felt uh, quite all-inclusive uh, included lots of organization it was very ambitious wide uh, broad uh, long long-term perspective uh, so I I, there's not all that much I think that should be added there more than what I was already into saying that you have to learn from what what has happened uh, during the process and uh, uh, how have the courts ruled maybe to get in people who uh, have have used it as a base how has it worked for for implementation in terms of uh, rulings and permits and so on and from all different levels because it's all different levels in Sweden at least three levels um, and then uh, also, I think that this, um, as I said earlier, the technology is changing then in terms of uh, inquiries and in terms of uh, how you can get the word out there. And, and citizen science, I think, is something that, that is interesting. We've used that a bit on the West Coast. Um, and there's been uh, inquiries to uh, people in terms of their um, their boating experiences and their their use of nature and so on. So there's lots of these things going on. And I think scientists, science moves all the time. Science is important and, and has uh, new perspectives on things, which is which is good to add, add to it. Yep. Excellent. Right. Well, we've had quite a, a comprehensive run through about who has been involved, who might be involved further. But generally, I think you're you are content with the processes that have been developed. Everything within marine planning is still in evolution as well. It's you you learn from the whole processes. That's the whole point about adaptive management. But we have picked up um, on a couple of elements that we are dealing perhaps now with. Uh, um, an environment, a business environment that is slightly different from what was envisaged when the directive itself was was being promoted and seven or eight years ago when we thought about what what the different uses made of marine environments were going to be. And of course, we were, we're coming out of this post-pandemic or coming into this post-pandemic period. So economic development is very important but we are also faced with the challenges for climate change um, and rebuilding our societies and rebuilding our economies. So we we proceed forward. So the, the next question that I'm going to ask you all is, how can the European Green Deal be supported by maritime spatial planning? Um, Commissioner Sinkovicius has recently launched the communication that uh, Carl just referred to on the sustainable blue economy and adding a blue dimension to the Green Deal, tying the two together and stating very clearly that there can be no green without blue. So perhaps apart from offshore wind farms contributing to the target of no net emissions, what other elements do you think can be included within the MSP process to help develop and deliver um, a, the Green Deal that we have over the next few, few years? Um, and are any of the, the issues that perhaps we might cover in this, so including offshore wind farm, but also perhaps shipping um, or more sustainable food production or so referring back to aquaculture there, are any of these aspects better addressed at more localised levels or is the better approach from the national, uh, the national level? So the combination of top down and bottom up. Who'd like to start? That's a Anybody in, with any contributions? Let's let's start first of all with how can the the green deal be supported by maritime spatial planning? Yes, Natalia, on you go. Natalia and then Tina. Thank you. Uh, I think that the key is that multi-use because I can give you a Polish example. In Polish, in the Polish MSP, we gave as much space for the renewable energy production as it's possible. Uh, so now we need to think about, for example, as I previously said, about hydrogen production also, not only wind farms, aquaculture also in the very same areas, not somewhere else because like 
RC is non-stretch, so we need to use the space wisely. And uh, also, our every activity, uh, whatever we do, we need to think about biodiversity, which is also the goal. And uh, that's why we need to we need to think about multi-use. That all that innovation, innovative uh, technologies, solutions, they need to also include uh, that possibility of coexistence with other undertakings. So uh, I think uh, that. And, and also uh, referring to the previous question, who else should be involved? Scientists and practitioners all together. So we need data, we need proper data interpretation, but also we need to have that practical view and taking it all together, we can create that wisely multi-used space. So I think this is the way uh, we should uh, we should follow. Thank you. Those are good points. I like that idea of wise multiple use of space. Tina, come on, please. Yes, Natalia uh, just said everything, almost everything I was think, <laughs> thinking, uh, but I could add that MSP is a kind of process where we can look for all opportunities so um, it's it's a good place for you know, innovative solutions but we as natalia said we need research and innovative uh, new new technologies and and we have to find out what the how to this is a question of also ecosystem approach how how we can benefit more of the sea what kind of um, production we can uh, expect in different parts of the sea. So, yeah. That's a, yes, that's a very good point. That's a, very, a really good point to think about the, the research that can be developed because there will be individual industry sectors, for example, that are already promoting um, elements of, of research for their own their own activities, their own output. Somebody mentioned earlier blue bioeconomy. Um, wherever that was, Finland, again, it was yourself. Um, so blue bioeconomy and uh, cultivation, algal elements that look planning ahead for, for new aspects. And in relation to that, um, does, this is perhaps a little bit of a wider scope of question, but does the concept of marine planning and maritime spatial planning need to start thinking about and taking into account um, changes in wider technology, for example, shipping technology and the move away from fossil fuels to either biofuels or, or low emission uh, technology in, in due course. How can marine planning be plugged into that element of development and that uh, aspect of research? That's probably a, a bigger question than the regional level, but good ideas have to start somewhere. So if they start in a regional area, in a, a little uh, localised place or, or a localised university, if somebody has the good idea, are the, is there the capacity to start developing that and to have it reflected ultimately in, in national marine planning processes or, or other planning processes. How do, I suppose it's all con it's coming together for the long term contribution to a far more sustainable approach. Um, and ultimately, it comes back to contributions to the circular economy as well, I suppose, too. So again, tying in lots of, of different policy areas. Any thoughts or any comments in relation to that? Uh, sorry, Carl. Yes, I can see you. Yeah, yep. yeah. Carl and, okay. the, and then Karina. So I'll add that on to my, my initial thought then, but we can start maybe in that in that end. So I'm thinking about hydrogen and, and, um, and wind farms producing hydrogen and maybe shipping uh, using hydrogen to, to, uh, to move about. And, and maybe this could be like a connection of different types of uh, hydrogen places. And it's not sure that you have to, uh, you have to ship ship the or pump the hydrogen into uh, onshore uh, uh, places it can be out uh, out to sea and you could fill your boat there on a sort of 
tanking station, you could say something like that. And that, uh, in terms of those sizes that you will get, you will need the permits and you need places and so on. Uh, but coming back to our um, plan, there were spaces in there for quite a lot of space for shipping. So maybe connected to uh, uh, what Natalia was saying that this multi-use thing that you'd have to do work smarter with what you have and, and maybe that the shipping routes rather will have to be a little bit smaller and leave some space over for the, the, the tanking infrastructure, which I think is a nice and interesting uh, idea and it could, it could uh, uh, minimize the, uh, the amount of, of energy put into actually transporting energy into land and so on. Um, and using hydrogen then as a vehicle for that um, in terms of uh, electricity. Then. Well, uh, and then the other issue was what other um, uh, things could be connected to the Green Deal there. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, from one idea from yesterday from, um, I think it was Sophie at a, uh, on uh, session five when we talked about multi-use again. Uh, she was discussing these different, they've done a series of uh, investigations on uh, on wind farms and using wind farms for restoration. And there you could use these uh, uh, wind farms for restoration of oysters, for example. You have the North Sea, which had so much oysters out there, which were basically dredged up and, and disappeared for different types of reasons. Uh, and I think that there is a growing awareness of the problems of our seas and and we still after all these years still don't have a lot of uh, fish on the on the coast of sweden for example not even on the west coast further off uh, there is fish but not so much on the coastline uh, and so i think there's a growing um, understanding of this uh, a larger frustration there's also a sort of a I'm beginning to feel a public uh, uh, acceptance for for larger measures or, or more measures rather. Uh, and there's also this that uh, this trend a little bit towards maybe uh, getting to action in terms of our different uh, what we try to do to reach our environmental targets and so on. Um, We've been measuring a lot. Uh, we've been following a lot, uh, but we're not. We're not. We are hesitant a little bit in terms of the action. And I think, well, maybe that's more my personal view. But that we have to get to this. We have to try it and see what uh, what kind of effects it, it will give in many cases. Um, that's yes. That's a, a good point. If we're hesitant in taking actions, perhaps the time available to take those actions is ticking. So therefore, there needs yeah. to be some kind of push. We need to get on and do it. Yeah. I think, I think um, we all feel it, and yeah. Karina, I, I saw your hand off earlier. Would you like to, to add to this? On your question was too difficult, and I wanted to so raise another issue still, and this is the um, status of marine environment, uh, which nowadays limits many many actions, as, as I just told in Finland, example, the aquaculture. And now the, the big question for all of us is how can MSP's implementation and this European Green Deal together tackle the biodiversity and eutrophication problems? I, I don't have the um, exact answers, um, but when emissions from landside activities like agriculture cause eutrophication, especially in coastal uh, waters, then we need actions on land side and maybe this circular economy it, and it's not maybe it's sure surely it's part of the solution and we have to have cross-sector cooperation and national and uh, regional level actions and then when we think that in territorial waters eutrophication is caused by cross-border emissions and sea base that we need cross-border cooperation and that means we need common strategies and common finances, um, financing for actions and that means EU level. So th th that was one answer to your, your pro former question. It is, yes, the um, 
the EU is a is a terrific organisation for being able to promote that sort of uh, that sort of ability and um, those opportunities. But there are third parties within the Baltic Sea and also within other sea basins as well. So it's uh, the cross border cooperation, I think. And somebody referred to it earlier in relation to next generation plans. That's also going to become perhaps more important over the next few years as every else develops their own plans um, when we see how they all interact. It comes back together with the point I was making in my introduction speech yesterday about parallel lines, everybody operating in isolation for their own interests, but the parallel lines in a vertical context are going to have to become horizontal at some point as well in, in the future. So um, I'm conscious that we're, we're entering into the last five minutes of this 90 minute session. Karina, have you got something else to, to add there? In Finland, we really know that we need uh, cross-border uh, cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> that's well. If you know and understand that, first of all, then that's part of the the process towards helping to achieve it. So, one final quiz round in that case. Um, within the, the, the last sort of five minutes, four five minutes. Any other final reflections about um, the about looking ahead? So, we are where we are. We have plans to, uh, at a greater or lesser extent, the future is exciting, the future is to a certain extent unknown. Um, Donata, I'll start with you first. Any messages from what you've done in the past to, to what you're looking ahead to do in the future? Any, anything that you want to pass on as a, a final valedictory comment as part of this? Just briefly, if you don't mind. So very briefly, I think um, yesterday uh, I heard uh, Maria say in her pitch uh, presentation regarding the VASAB long-term perspective, uh, a very nice idea is to invite everyone to a journey of co-creation, co-implementation, co-cooperation, co monitoring everything. <laughs> So this uh, this might be the key, this might be the journey, and this might be what we should do. Excellent. Right. Next up on my screen, I can see Tina. What are your, okay. yes, your final I, thoughts? I would like to highlight what also Jacek said today, that now when the... Uh, now, when we have done the first maritime spatial plans, the um, maritime area is more noticed. <laughs> and and it, this, uh, this I, I believe that the next round will be more busy and there will be more uh, interested uh, stakeholders participating more eagerly. And, and that was also a very good point of Donata that FASAB is doing its long-term perspective and that uh, all input is welcome to that too. Thank you. A very positive note, yes. The, the long-term perspective taken from uh, a supranational organisation but all encompassing as well. Karina, you're next on my screen. Any thoughts to, to finish with? Uh, we, MSP is a cyclic process and we have to uh, uh, keep keep the round <laughs> keep, keep keep around going. <laughs> Yes, it is. And there's a, a saying that what goes around comes around and there's no such thing sometimes as an entirely new idea. But it is all incremental. It's building on good experiences and good ideas in the past or tweaking some things that have not worked as well as they might have done previously, but seeing how they can be improved for, for future utilisation. So that's part of the circular and recycling economy as well. No ideas, I don't think, are, are ever wasted. Natalia, what about yourself? Any thoughts to, to contribute just as a, a round, uh, rounding off period? Yes, thank you. Well, you know, yesterday when Jan was singing and today when uh, that, that rock said love songs and when Magda talked about emotions uh, in uh, maritime cultural heritage uh, context, I thought how great it is that we can have such meetings which are very professional and at the same time we can sing, we can talk about emotions that we're actually one big MSB family, MSB friends. And I think this is what we need the most because 
we work together, we cooperate, uh, we have uh, solutions for many problems and we have fun at the same time. And this is, I think, what we need to have energy to work <laughs> on our MSPs, thank you. I think that's a wonderful point. Uh, yes, absolutely. I have. I can totally say that in the years I've been involved with marine planning, I have had some terrifically fun experiences. It's been great. And many of them have taken place in Riga and one in particular involved the karaoke session I referred to yesterday, which will live long in my memory, unfortunately, as it will do to those of the others who heard me and Sylvain Gombersing as well, but never mind. Right, Carl, moving along, the, the last point, and then just to, to reflect and to bring this together. Any comments? Yes. Um, so uh, thanks so much for an interesting discussion and a good meeting, I think. Uh, so implementation, I think it's uh, it's good. I mean, we're, we're getting to the point where plans become implemented. That's where we want to go. It becomes concrete. It becomes... Uh, something that takes the visionary ideas and makes it into something. And uh, I think, as I mentioned a few times today, the learning process, learning from these different processes, putting that into the next band, seeing how the implementation will change, how the next plan will, uh, what it will look like. I want to throw along what we did previously with interviewing businesses, actually interviewing quite a few number of businesses on their own, and you can do that digitally. It doesn't take all that much long, but they get they get to put themselves in the position what will happen in 10 years or five years. You get these different uh, time periods. I think that's important. You can also use the digital inquiries or citizen science or all these other solutions. Um, and in terms of multi-use, if we're going to have multi-use in, in any wider aspects, I really think that there has to be some type of regulation, policy, part of the permits, there has to be something enforcing that. Otherwise, uh, business owners will take the cheap, easy, and risk-free version. Uh, so they have to have get value out of there. And unfortunately, I think that that will need to be pushed in. And um, thank you very much. Thank you for all of those reflections. That's um, That's been a very broad approach, but with some nice details coming out from in depth and on a number of different points. I'd say I'm, again, humbled by the, the sheer breadth and depth of experience that's on display. I'm also very cognizant of the fact that all of you are reporting all of this in English um, for the benefit of, of me, who only speaks really English and a very little bit of French, very badly. Um, but the, the mechanisms that you have in place, the approaches that you're taking, the ability to work across borders now, but also to develop those further, I think is, is standing the Baltic region in very, very good stead. And I have found this to be an extremely illuminating session. And I hope the, the rest of our audience has as well. And I hope you've learned from uh, your, your counterparts within this session too. I'm looking just back through um, the the comments on the slide, there are a number of points that have come through. We've, I think we've triggered thoughts in our, our watching audience. Um, some of them just picking up, uh, aside from the suggestion that we play Ya Ya Ding Dong, but we're not going there just at the moment. Um, there are future, future elements that are being picked up. Autonomous sailing is one of the aspects that's been produced or that's been flagged as something that needs to be taken into account. That's not so, that's certainly not something that we thought about in 2013, 2014, the ability of, of vessels to navigate themselves and the safety elements that are reflected with that, the environmental elements that are connected to it as well. So we are standing on the threshold of um, further exciting developments within the marine sphere, within the maritime sphere, uh, across many different sea basins. We will learn from each of those different sea basins. And uh, if we are able to maintain fun times when we're, we're coming to different solutions and exchange knowledge, then that's, that's all that's all anybody could really ask. So thank you very much to all of you for participating in this session this afternoon. Uh, my applause to you. Um, Edgars, I'm going to hand back to you just for a second because I believe that you will have some results for this latest word cloud for us and we can perhaps finish the session with that. Is that okay? Absolutely and I also love the online comment that the Scottish flag indicates the land-sea interaction and cross-border cooperation as well. 
<laughs> yes, the author of that comment and I have had many discussions about the origins of land-sea interactions and presumably will continue to have several more as well. But they they definitely will. And uh, that's also one of the takeaways that, uh, as we mentioned, this is just the, dis the start of the discussion. But as you mentioned, um, we will turn the spotlight back to our online audience for the last time, at least during this forum, and see what their votes, or in this case, their words have been. And uh, if you remember correctly, we asked the same question as yesterday, and that was, what is the most noticeable issue for MSP that may arise due to the European Green Deal in the next decades? So the question was the same yesterday and today, and we will try to make a um, comparison with yesterday's and today's word cloud. And what do we see there? What is the main... Um, what is the main difference that comes to, to your mind and what you notice? Rona? That, right, uh, is the, the bigger one yesterday's and the exactly. smaller the bigger yes, one is yesterday's one and the one yes, still yes, changing, yes, yes. by the way. That's today's, yes, because people are still... Indeed, the, st still adding, that's terrific. Um, Multi-use, obviously, both imp important on both days. Um, Heart, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's yes. There's certainly that's that's really interesting. There seem to be fewer uh, ideas in today's square than there were from yesterday. There were there were uh, there was a different and perhaps slightly more diverse spread of answers for yesterday. But key points are still there: tourism and blue growth opportunities, aquaculture and and the circular economy. All of this is coming through. This is terrific. Um, yes, the energy generation targets specifics are highlighted in both cases. There are so many different as aspects that we need to think about. If you actually sat down and thought about all the different activities, all the different interests that are available in your own specific sea area, and then the ones next to you, and then the ones opposite, and ultimately the entire sea basin, it would blow your mind. So perhaps the best approach to all of this is the approach that you take when you're eating an elephant. And how do you eat an elephant? In very small chunks. So we're, although we have the bigger picture in our minds, we need to be able to target different elements on a section-by-section -section basis, but always be mindful of the different connections between them. So I think there are lots of really good aspects within all of this. Um, the hydrogen aspect that we've brought through in this last discussion, I think, is extremely important as well, because that's projecting right into the future. And that, along with the, the renewable energy elements, the, the, the power generation side of things, is perhaps the key to unlocking quite a lot of of other aspects um, in relation to this. But I'm very pleased to see that biodiversity protection is reflected in both elements. Um, certainly as the, the representative of DGN, when we uh, negotiated the, the directive, getting the, the, the ability of marine planning to help deliver good environmental status was, was our key ask. Um, and that I think has been accomplished and is going to become even more important as we go ahead into the the, the second or into the third decade, further into the third decade of the 21st century. So I'll leave it at that point there. Thank you, Edgar. You're right.